You are listening to Mother 3, Frog by Frog. This is frog number seven, pitch black and covered in soot. Flint stands outside a burning cabin. Lighter's son, Fuel, is trapped inside, with seconds to go before the entire building collapses and goes up in flames. Flint is the last man in Tasmalee who can save this boy's life. It's time to see what this cowboy is made of. But instead of talking about that, I want to start by talking about the save theme, or the song that plays while loading your file. This song is entrancing to me for some reason. It might be because I woke up extra early this morning to play Mother 3 and take notes, so maybe I was loopier than usual, but I sat at my desk, I mean my Game Boy Advance, and let the song loop for like three minutes. Honestly, now that I listen to this song again, I'm pretty sure it's the perfect personification of being groggy and half asleep. It's like a wind-up toy that can't decide if it wants to hit the snooze button. Anyway, I'm not saying this song is a work of art, but in my long-running list of things I like about Mother 3, the save theme is one of them. Why not appreciate a game that, even in its file selection, can put a small smile on your face? Speaking of great songs we haven't talked about yet, As You Wish plays any time the player opens the pause menu. The art of the pause menu song is slowly being lost, as more and more video games greet the player with silence and selection chimes, but not at Mother 3. As I write this post, I'm listening to a 30 minute loop of this song, and I don't have any further explication to offer. Other than that, it makes me want to watch The Princess Bride. If you get that reference, good for you. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's a good song. It's relaxing, it feels unique, the background is a little Twin Peaksy. Every time I have Flint stop in the middle of the forest to eat some nut bread, I pause for a moment and listen. There's the transition I've been looking for, nut bread. Before going to save fuel, I decided to heal Flint, and because there's no hot spring in sight, I chow down a few pieces of nut bread as fuel yells for help out of a top floor window. I don't know what he's yelling for. Doesn't he know this is Tasmalee? There's no rush. Or maybe there is. Shortly after appearing in the window, Fuel is replaced in the pane by a mysterious blue creature with red eyes. Also, another detail I have never noticed while playing Chapter 1 is that when your back is turned, the creature looks out the window and shows itself. But if you turn around and face the window, it disappears. I like this detail because it's a little bit funny and a little bit creepy. The creature doesn't exactly look threatening, at least from here, so the game of Forest Fire Peekaboo feels innocent enough. At the same time though, appearing and disappearing in the window suggests an uncomfortable amount of autonomy. Thus far, I've fought yams and bats, not exactly the highest IQ fighters. Anyway, instead of musing on this little blue creature for too long, let's get inside and save this kid's life. The Flying Mouse in the Burning House If you already thought Flint was cool, you probably saw this coming. If you needed more convincing, then pay attention. Flint knows how to make an entrance. To get inside the cabin, you have to dash. Imagine something called a B button. To break the door down. Splinters fly in all directions as Flint bashes his way in. Honestly, this whole sequence in the cabin feels like something out of an action movie. I can imagine Flint running into the first room and being totally disoriented by the smoke and flames, while in the background he hears the snapping and groaning of the slow but sure collapse of the entire house. 
I'm going to say this a lot from now on, but here's the first time. I totally think Mother 3 would work as an animated series. Even in its simple pixel form, Mother 3 is so consistently and cinematically good at portraying its story, especially the atmosphere and tone. Which, I guess, is part of what makes the Mother series so fun and unique. It is able to hit tonally serious and intense and tonally bizarre and comedic moments with the same level of success. I think this is why so many people connect with these games so strongly. The Mother series has so much heart, and sometimes so much lack of it. And it portrays each with equal acuity. Yikes, what a digression. Okay, anyway, uh, speaking of tone, there's no music playing in here. Just the crackle of fire. You'll also notice the small blue figure flying around, which is the same red-eyed something that espied us earlier through the window. When I look at the screen cap, I can tell it's a flying mouse, but I'll be honest, sometimes I forget what this enemy is when I replay the game. I'm not saying that the enemy itself is forgettable, but just that the actual sprite isn't recognizable for me. In fact, when I go back and narrate this text for the post, I do think that this inside the cabin moment is one of the times where Mother 3 suffers a bit by being on the Game Boy Advance, or you can at least tell how the game was once planned to be a 3D story. When this mouse flies around the room on a 2D plane, it doesn't have the same amount of depth. It kind of looks like it's just awkwardly swiping back and forth on the screen. It doesn't really have a sense of height. It doesn't have a sense of depth. And I'm not pointing this out as a bad thing. I just think it's one of those interesting moments where if this game had come out on the N64 like what was intended, this scene probably would have had more depth. We probably would have seen the flying mouse you know, zipping around overhead. It probably would have jumped in and out of frame, maybe even swooping down near Flint. But it's just one of those things that when you translate it in, into 2D, it's, it's just hard to uh, ma maintain that same kind of perspective and, and sort of make it work. So um, I still love this scene. I still think the cabin burning down is great. Uh, I just noticed, I was like, man, this, this flying mouse looks kind of awkward. Like, I wonder what the inspiration was for, for making sure that it was, it was present here. And I can't help but wonder if maybe it's trying to recreate something that worked a little better with the three-dimensional space of the N64. Anyway, no matter what I think about it, uh, when you try to go upstairs, the flying mouse suddenly attacks. Uh, it isn't very intimidating, though. I've always thought it looked like a rabid Looney Tune. But now I feel bad for saying that, because this is the first time I've ever noticed that the flying mouse lost its front legs for wings. For some reason, I always thought the lower wing was just like a short little leg, but I guess I was just interpreting the sprite in incorrectly. This poor little guy can't even walk normally anymore. Being the first chimera we encounter in Mother 3, and probably also one of the pig mask's rushed experiments, I guess it's no surprise that the flying mouse's functionality would be all messed up. In its battle sprite, anyway, it doesn't even look like it can fly properly. The mouse didn't ask for this existence, and if those wings were taken from some huge fly somewhere, then that fly didn't ask for it either. Though, like last post when I mentioned Mother 3's balance of tragedy and comedy, the flying mouse's battle song, Backbeat Battle, does not have a very serious tone, and its battle sound effects are one of the sillier sets in the game. <laughs> got kind of thrown off in this battle because the song was so difficult to combo. I'm not great at combo hits in the first place, but usually I can string together seven or eight. It's kind of jarring to miss every time. I can feel sorry for the flying mouse all day, but this battle doesn't exactly inspire sadness. You do get cheese for defeating it though, which is fitting for fighting a mouse. Flint is one of the party members who loves cheese, so he'll gain extra health if he eats it. Contemporary RPGs can boast about any feature they want. All I need is Mother 3's Taste for Cheese feature, which awards certain characters 60 hit points, people who love cheese, some 40 hit points, they don't like cheese, and some 20 hit points, they hate cheese. You can learn a lot about someone based on their relationship with cheese, after all. 
After defeating the flying mouse, Flint heads upstairs. But before moving on, I wanted to add one more thing about Mother 3's first chimera. I love this enemy because it adds an additional chaotic element to the already chaotic scenario. Flint just defended Thomas and Leiter from a trio of fireflies, and the burning cabin alone is dangerous enough by itself to motivate the player to save fuel. Adding another enemy, not a full boss fight, just an enemy, is such a good decision, especially an enemy we haven't seen anything else like yet. To me, it feels like just one more problem for our protagonist to deal with. Oh, fuel is trapped on the top floor? And there's a weird flying blue mouse blocking the way? It makes it feel like every second counts, which is an important feeling to establish in a turn-based RPG, when sometimes the pacing and the tension are the first things to wane in a series of battles. I think it's very important for turn-based RPGs to find a way to keep players involved in their stories. Many people don't find turn-based combat all that engaging, and so if you're not able to remind the player of the stakes as often as you can, it's likely they either won't want to keep playing or won't have much investment in the story at the end of the day. For example, one time I was playing Final Fantasy V. Now, Final Fantasy V doesn't exactly have the best story in the series, but, but it still has some fun and exciting moments, and in, in the broad strokes of the story at least, there are some emotional high points. However, Final Fantasy V was the first Final Fantasy game I ever played, and there were some times where I would be in such a long dungeon or such a long stretch of exploration that I would actually forget what was happening in, in the overarching story. Now, obviously, the Mother series and the Final Fantasy series tell very different types of stories, and I'm not saying that every story needs to be judged on the same standards. However, I think Mother 3 is so good, especially in Chapter 1, at keeping the player invested in what's happening and helping the combat reflect that aim. See, if this burning log cabin was in any other RPG, I would imagine there would be 10 to 15 minutes of random encounters which would lead up to the flying mouse as a bit of a mini-boss at the end. Instead, we keep the tension high, we keep the stakes relevant, and we have Flint fight one enemy and save one person and get in and out of here in about five minutes. If the burning log cabin encounter was any longer than this, the stakes would start to matter less. Is fuel really in danger if we're battling enemies for 20 minutes? Would it really make sense for the flying mouse to conveniently wait for Flint at the end of a mini dungeon? I think small decisions like this are truly what make Chapter 1 of Mother 3 so effective. It doesn't waste the player's time. It puts the story in the stakes before anything else. Some RPGs are afraid to do this, either because their stories are weak or because they're putting too much stock into the entertainment value of turn-based battles. I just think it was such a smart decision by Itoi and his team to keep this log cabin scenario brief. If they were to stretch out this forest fire section any longer than it needs to be, the tension would start to drain from the scenes and the stakes would matter less and less. Are Hanawa and the boys really in danger if Flint can take his time saving lighter and fuel? Again, I just want to reiterate that clearly many Final Fantasy games are telling epic adventure stories where heroes are sent out on quests, often with the evil looming in the background. I'm not saying Final Fantasy V fails or that Final Fantasy games need to be paced like Mother 3. I'm simply pointing out the strengths of Mother 3 here. It knows what it's got going on, it knows what the player is caring about, and it makes decisions in its plot to keep those stakes at the forefront. I think this is also why the player develops such an emotional connection with Flint so quickly. Everything we do with him matters, every battle we fight with him has some sort of consequence. By the time we've spent only 30 to 40 minutes with Flint, maybe even less if you're a faster player, we've really bonded with him and that matters because some huge emotional moments are just around the corner. I guess this is just one of those moments where you can tell that Mother 3 was something that sat in Shigesatu Itoi's head for more than a decade. He's clearly thought over this scenario and these characters many, many times. And while the allure of Earthbound 64 will always fascinate me, I can't deny that Mother 3 is a concise and effective story. 
This is something that has been revised and revised and revised again and again and again to near perfection. Anyway, all I'm trying to say here is I think a big reason a lot of people hate turn-based battles isn't because of the mechanics themselves, but because when you do too many of them, the story floats farther and farther away. In my opinion, the way to make turn-based battles matter is to do less of them. That way, all the encounters still feel like they're part of a story, and they can all still feel unique. Look no farther than Undertale to see this idea brought to its full potential. Every encounter in Undertale feels unique, and every one incentivizes the player to explore. There are even ramifications for the way you fight enemies in the long-term stakes of the game. Okay, I don't want to turn this into an Undertale discussion. I just think this is a really fascinating thing. Actually, the last five minutes, none of what I've said has been scripted. I've kind of just been thinking about this idea. Um, mostly because there's, uh, you know, v video game personalities like, like you know, Dunkey, for example, who often says he hates turn-based battles. And I don't always think turn-based itself is the enemy. Um, in fact, I, I sometimes think it's what turn-based takes us away from that uh, really bothers people. You know, if you're sort of in a fun encounter or a fun part of a story, and then you have to you know, fight no fewer than 25 turn-based battles into a boss that might kill you, the player might start to wonder, were these battles here for my actual experience, for me to actually have fun, or was this just to pad an RPG's length so it can seem more epic in scope than it actually is? And uh, I, think, I think that's something that a lot of RPGs of the Super Nintendo and PlayStation 1 era really suffer from even though i still love them i love a good dungeon crawler i love spending 70 hours hitting the a button i don't know why i just do i actually love it uh, but i really 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 do think that mother 3 has something special here and i just have to point it out anyway finally back to the script the cabin looks even more grim upstairs there's a large wooden structure on the floor fallen from above that you also have to dash through. I can't think of many other times in Mother 3 that you have to dash through things. I've always felt like the team might have had more interactive set pieces planned for the game, but ended up scrapping them. My only real reason for thinking this is that the beginning of the game features dash a few times to pass obstacles, which could have been a way to condition the player into viewing environments as interactive puzzles. I don't have much more evidence other than that, and the Earthbound 64 trailer. The Earthbound 64 trailer seems both more cinematic and more diverse in its approaches to gameplay than the final GBA product of Mother 3. While talking with Satoru Iwata and Shigeru Miyamoto about the cancellation of Earthbound 64, Itoi does mention that, after seeing the potential of the Nintendo 64 with Super Mario 64, he wanted something like that for his game which have always taken to mean more complex movement and more complex gameplay scenarios. As we've explored already on Frog by Frog, we know Itoi had big ideas for Earthbound 64, so I can understand why he would want a diverse set of gameplay scenarios to accompany the world of the game, which he hoped to be both dynamic and cinematic. Don't forget that Toy Story was a huge inspiration for Earthbound 64, at least in the sense that a toy and his team wanted to tell an emotional story using 3D models. As we can see from the minecart scene and the scene where Flint is driving around some kind of vehicle, there's more going on gameplay-wise than walking around in the GBA Mother 3 and occasionally breaking something with a dash. Anyway, this is turning into a digression that's full of conjectures, which was already on the piggyback of a digression, and I have no idea what Itoi specifically had in mind for Earthbound 64, just as I have no idea if the development team of Mother 3 planted these obstacles to condition the player to interact more with the environment. I'd also like to brush up a bit more on my Earthbound 64 development history before making too many guesses about Itoi's aims. At the most basic level, it's at least satisfying to crash through this huge pillar. So then, just in the nick of time, Flint takes fuel into his care and the two escape from the cabin, just as it collapses behind them. If you feel like I'm skipping over anything here, I'm not. You pretty much just talk to fuel, then walk out of the cabin. 
Fuel joins you as your next temporary party member, and I think he's actually capable of contributing more in a fight than Thomas. In one of my battles, Fuel threw a rock at a Yam yeah monster, which, even though it only did like 3 damage, was enough to be the finishing blow. Fuel also had some endearing lines of dialogue. When Fuel and Flint both stand in the wreckage, covered head to toe in soot, Fuel says, I'm pitch black and covered in soot, but I'm alive. Which he follows up with, And you're pitch black too, Mr. Flint. Thank you, Mr. Pitch Black Flint. I love the relief in this moment, captured perfectly with Fuel's contagious sense of youth. Fuel's house has just collapsed behind him, but he understands that he is lucky, and that there is always something to be thankful for. Like we've pointed out a few times, Mother 3 balances its tragedies with its levities. I don't know what it is, really. I've always liked these lines of dialogue. Fuel seems like a cool kid. He's probably, at least as I've always assumed, a couple years older than Lucas and Klaus, maybe supposed to be seen as nearly a teenager. Fuel is, I think, the party member you have for the shortest amount of time in the game. You walk down the stairs, then outside, then back to Tasmily. After that, he's gone. However, Fuel's contribution, though small, interests me more than any chip damage he might provide against an enemy. I recently read an older interview with Itoi about the very first Mother game, where he discusses party members and their roles in the story. You can name your entire party and mother at the beginning of the game, and you'll eventually encounter them in the story. Rather than allowing the player to switch characters freely at any time, the story was written so that switching characters would occur naturally. The parting and joining of party members itself creates a large part of the drama. The first three chapters of Mother 3 are a perfect example of this idea coming to fruition, two games in over 20 years later. In Earthbound, you gain one party member at a time, until the Chosen One and his friends are assembled. In Mother, there is a mixture of temporary and permanent party members, with some leaving and returning. In Mother 3, characters come and go, disappear and reappear, lend a hand, then take a break. Off the top of my head, I think Chapter 1 involves six temporary party members, which fits really well thematically. Think of it this way. How many video games have you played where, for no real reason, NPCs are useless? Maybe it's your AI-controlled squad in a first-person shooter, or the notorious green units from the Fire Emblem series, who often throw themselves into death's waiting arms for seemingly no reason. Obviously, games are made to be played by the player, so all the fun would be lost in The Legend of Zelda if the Knights of Hyrule defeated Ganondorf before you got to him, or if your rival and Pokemon Red and Blue remained the true champion at the end. But I love how a toy reimagines the trope of the lonely hero in a video game. In the first chapter of Mother 3, other villagers have tried and failed to help out. Bronson, Leiter, Thomas, even Fuel himself, all of these characters communicate to the player what type of place Tasmily is. This is a village where people help each other. This is not an RPG where your main character sets off on a quest because someone tells them they're the only person who can do it. Thomas came knocking on Flint's door because the rest of the town had already sprung into action and they were going to need Flint's help too. This is an RPG where we get to see other characters try and fail to accomplish the same tasks that the player themselves get to solve. By the time Chapter 4 rolls around, it makes sense that Lucas has to assemble his own party of heroes, that people no longer join him to lend a hand, even briefly. At that point in the story, no one from Tasmily really gives a shit anymore. Even characters like Abby sustain minor injuries from trying to help out, which isn't to mention that we don't even know Leiter's fate yet. Did he and Thomas make it out alive? What about Hinawa and the boys? Flynn's party members come and go in Chapter 1 because it's a part of the drama. In a way, you're playing as Flint and as Tasmily. If Thomas had sent Flint out alone, and not a single other NPC had been encountered, there'd be very little drama, or at least a much weaker sense of setting. I think King K said it best in his video about Mother 3, where he said chapter 1 of this game was truly unlike anything he had ever played. 
This is at least the only game I've ever played where it feels like the NPCs actually have a meaningful role, not just in the story itself, but in the action of the story. They're, they're right there with you. They're often on the sidelines. There's even a point in, in chapter one where people have to save Lint from himself when he has an angry outburst. It's just so fascinating to me that these ideas Shigesato Atoy had in 1989 came to fruition almost 30 years later. It just goes to show how with writers and artists and any sort of creative people, the ideas that you start with are often the ideas you work with throughout your entire career. I think Itoi was always looking for a way to tell a story that involved more than just the main characters. Again, I always put Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy and The Legend of Zelda on blast, but like, those games have to do with the trope of the chosen ones, the heroes of light, you know, the people who are going to collect the crystals or whatever. And I think Itoi was always looking for a way to subvert that trope. And really, one of the best ways to do it is seen in Mother 3, when at times the hero isn't the only person whose contributions matter. Anyway, I can't wait to talk more about this idea throughout the rest of Chapter 1, and especially in Chapter 3, which features the game's most unique party combination. It's so cool to me how in tune Itoy's mind was to storytelling in video games, even back in the 80s, when, like he mentions, many studios seemed to just want to do more. 10 party members, 50 levels, 100 unique enemies. It was all about numbers, 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 numbers. Honestly, you could take the above quote, put it in a Mother 3 interview, and never guess it was something he actually said 30 years ago. It's just so cool how consistent his artistic aims were, and how he was always trying to tell a certain type of meaningful story. The last thing I'll say about this for now is that even though party members like Thomas and Fuel can't be controlled in battle, I like that they still follow behind your main character like normal party members do. If Thomas hadn't accompanied Flint visually, we'd lose that Tasmanian sense of community. If Fuel didn't accompany Flint, we might think, wait, did Fuel just run through the rest of the forest by himself? There are little fires everywhere. Yeah, it's a fantasy world where mice can fly, but Itoi still preserves his verisimilitude, his realness. And like I said, it's also nice to not walk around alone. Anyway, let's get Fuel home. Out of anyone so far, he's had it the worst, or at least what was nearly the worst. The last thing Tasmali needs is for someone's kids to get wrapped up in all this craziness. Gentle Rain Leaving the cabin, or should I say, the pile of rubble, isn't exactly comforting, seeing as we have to go back through the gauntlet of yeah monsters. but there's nothing left here for fuel, for flint, for anyone. If you've ever wanted to move into a forest and pull a Thoreau, just remember that a science fiction pig army can attack at any time. Maybe Lighter and Fuel have some extended family members they could stay with in the meantime, like Butane and Tinder, or Match and Spark. Either way, it'll be a while before anyone is living in that cabin again, but I'm sure the loyal, friendly people of Tasmali will have it rebuilt in no time. Although the trip back is pretty easy. Like I mentioned before, Fuel can actually contribute in combat sometimes. Not that it's really necessary with the Yam monsters, and with the Lighter's Lumber equipped, Flint can swing his way through pretty easily. The most notable thing here is that if you go into the hot spring with fuel, I know it sounds sketchy to go into a hot spring with a little boy, but you'd take a hot bath if you could if you had just lost your house, so take it easy. All of the soot, except that on Flint's and Fuel's faces, will wash away. I've always thought this was pretty funny, and again, this is something you can only do once with a temporary party member, so it's at least special in that regard. Some players might not even have fuel in their party for more than two minutes, yet there is something memorable you can do only at this part of the game and only with him. That's just so cool to me. In the broad expanse of Mother 3, there's a unique interaction you can have with one party member who you have for two minutes. In a similar vein, I always remember Porky's younger brother, Picky, from Earthbound, because while the craven Porky does not help out in battles while being a temporary party member, Picky sometimes does. In his little way, for that five minutes that you have him, he makes his mark on the story. I also like how Flint saves someone else's son while his own children are still out there. It's cool to see Flint walking and Fuel following behind him. Flint's a good guy. He really is a hero. Then, finally, we are free from the forest. To think it loomed over us for so long. I'm happy to be out of it. 
Matt, Abby, and Abbott can be found waiting around the forest's entrance, which I think is the first time we see that Matt may be the Tasmali town drunk. He calls Flint Mr. Pitch Black Guy and hiccups a few times. But hey, I'm not here to judge. Matt was helping out alongside everyone else. Maybe he needed a little liquid courage before running into the Sunshine Forest. I wouldn't blame him. Then there's Abbott and Abby, who claim to have seen the flying mouse, which even attacked Abby. Something that always cracks me up is how, after Abbott describes what he thinks the mouse looked like, Abby here was attacked by some bizarre flying mouse with bug wings, Abby says, That was a very easy to understand explanation. These two are such sweethearts. Maybe they really weren't trying to be tutorial NPCs a few posts ago when Abby insisted she was helping us find the forest out of the kindness of her heart. And while it's much more prevalent in the upcoming scene, I enjoy how none of the Tasmillions are one and done characters. Even in small moments of dialogue like this, Itoy builds each individual character and gives them something to talk about. Abby has sustained an injury. That's notable. It's also Abbott and Abby who first discuss the emergence of the Chimeras, one of Mother 3's major plot points. Stuff like this is important to me as a player. It makes me feel like I'm reading a novel instead of just playing a video game, where all of the minor characters have some sort of role to play. Here, I'm thinking again of Itoy's rejection of tropes, and how villagers in the RPGs of the late 80s and early 90s often just talked about problems, like a dragon up in the mountains, or a crystal having lost its energy. Like earlier, when I said that in a way we're playing as Flint and as Tasmali, this is one of those moments where I feel a little less alone, even though I'm playing as a lonesome looking cowboy. Speaking of every character having a role to play, the following scene is an amazing example of character and setting development. Flint and Fuel find Thomas a bit farther up the road, and he explains that he and Lighter made it out safely. Well, he says it a bit more pompously than that, but I think he deserves this one. Getting Lighter all the way back to safety, especially when he was incapacitated, is just as difficult as anything Flint accomplished with Fuel, or at least pretty close. So bravo, Thomas. At least today, you've earned it. You're a hero too. Then, Fuel and Lighter are reunited, as various Tasmillians congregate around Lighter and discuss the events that have transpired. I've always really loved this scene. The dialogue between the characters feels so natural, like they've all known each other for years, like they're all neighbors, which they are. You've got Bud and Lou, who work for Lighter, remarking on how their boss rarely thanks anyone, yet he thanks Flint straight away. You've got Lighter joking that he doesn't want to show his not-so-tough side. You've got Ed giving us a small piece of exposition when he mentions that Flint and Lighter have been friends since they were kids. And I haven't even mentioned the song that plays. Gentle Rain begins playing as soon as Lighter is revealed on the table, and even though Mother 3 doesn't have voice acting, somehow I can hear Fuel yell out for his father every time I see this scene. Honestly, somehow I can hear everyone talking. I swear I'm not crazy. <laughs> Every line of dialogue just feels so natural. The scene itself feels earned, especially after the Sunshine Forest sequence, where the ground was colored red, where there was fire all over the place, where we just saw someone's home collapse. This scene comes in at just the right time. We finally have a breather. Everyone is going to be okay. And of course, right as Bronson says, the only thing that could make this any stranger is if it suddenly started pouring rain. It starts to rain. I think another thing that makes this scene and this chapter so successful is that all of the player's efforts are rewarded with tangible outcomes. I know I make fun of older RPGs a lot, but I really do still enjoy them. Still, it's nice for the stakes to not always be saving the entire world, or killing some huge monster, at least from the get-go. Mother 3 definitely builds to a plot of that level eventually, and I'll talk about that more as we go, but I can't say enough how great it feels to have entered the forest to save Lighter and Fuel, and to now see Lighter and Fuel saved. You know, even if Itoi didn't fully accomplish his aim for having a living, changing city, which Miyamoto compared to The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, Tasmali feels real enough to me. We get to meet and interact with everyone in some way or another. We get to learn things about each of the NPCs and how they think. Tasmili feels like it's made up of good people. As Bud later says, in haiku form, 
helping others out, being helped out by others, helping others out. It's not exactly a high art poem, but I've always liked its sweet sentiment. Tasmalee focuses on helping each other, and that's really all that matters at the end of the day. Anyway, letting each character having their little chance to shine is cool, like when Lighter sets his own broken leg back into place. Even though this moment is played for humor, I like it too as a hopeful sign of Tasmalee's resilience. Bad things might happen to good people, but good people can always bounce back. Or at least good people can always pop their broken legs back into place, but it still all works out. Let's hope Thomas is right, and this rain puts out the fire. Time to go inside. That's no typo. When the scene finally changes, we're suddenly inside the Yado Inn, where a small group of Tasmillians gathers to discuss the night's events. Specifically, Thomas, Leiter, Fuel, Flint, Bud, Lou, and a new villager, Tessie, hang out in one of the Yado Inn's rooms to take everything in. Leiter, a little bit loopy, remarks on how both Fuel and Flint were covered in soot. I like how everyone keeps pointing out this whole covered in soot thing. I, I have a theory on this, but I'll save it for a later uh, video. Even though Hinawa and the kids are still out there, and Isaac hasn't come back from picking mushrooms, the rain, like Tessie points out, came just in time. And Bud's off spitting haikus, so everything isn't so bad. The Yado Inn theme fits so well here. The song is cozy, yet a little bit forlorn, like returning home after a long, rough day, but feeling hopeful that everything might still be okay. I've always thought it matches Jackie's character design really well, too. There's just something that's both depressing and not depressing at the same time about this track, perfect for dozing in and out of sleep. I think the track is actually making me a little bit sleepy, especially with the rain outside the windows, Okay, it's time to wrap this video up. Let's see what else there is to talk about. Uh, well, this has been a long night for Tasmalee. I decided to walk around the Yado Inn for a little while where Jackie can be found behind the bar. He promises to help next time something comes up, but I wouldn't exactly bet on him. I'd rather take fuel, honestly. Not that I blame Jackie for not wanting to run out into the fire, but let's stop pretending, Jackie. Though I also met Jackie's wife, Betsy, who doesn't seem to have much faith in him. My husband is such a wimp, she says. He was a nervous wreck during the fire. Jeez, <laughs> Betsy would probably fit right in with the other gossiping women. I might have made my crack at Jackie, but I don't think badly of him. Everyone was a bit nervous during the fire. Thomas might have played it off like he was acting like a siren, but I think he was actually just freaking out. Plus, the night is still young. There might be time for Jackie to redeem himself yet. Oh yeah, and then there's Bob, I guess. He's just a guy who hangs out and drinks. I have no memory of Bob from previous playthroughs, so we'll have to see how often he actually shows up. Uh, for now, cheers to Bob, though, again, I admit I did not even know he was a character. And I think that's about it for now. Uh, even though I was directed to the last room on the right, I peeked inside the middle room and I found a save frog, so that's where we're going to end for today. I wanted to check and see whether you could leave the inn without going to take a rest or if you have to lay down to advance to the next part of the game, but I didn't end up doing that experiment because I didn't want to miss the chance to use the save frog, so I know, very exciting stuff. Experiments about leaving buildings. Anyway, I can tell that Flint really needs some rest, so I'm going to stop it here for now. Uh, I feel like a toy might say something like, Flint has been through so much, just let him go to sleep already. And I agree, this poor guy carries a whole village on his shoulders.